Today we're going to be reviewing the Chevrolet Blazer. Now while other reviewers would take this vehicle off-road to the trails, we're going to be taking a look under the hood and underneath this vehicle to see what's inside and how it works. And we're going to start under the hood where we've got GM's Ecotec 2 liter 4 cylinder turbocharged engine. It sits transversely for front wheel drive. Also to note the Blazer comes with a 3.6 liter V6 engine for those of you who want to take this to the racetrack. Taking a look at how the air flows into the engine, we've got this giant air scoop at the front here which is going to send air into the air box over over there where it's going to get filtered out. That air is going to come across this tube over here and then be sent down to the back where the turbocharger is. Now accessing the air filter on the blazer isn't too difficult. There's five Phillips screws which I kind of hate because I feel like they're going to strip out after a while that you have to remove in order to get the air box off. They kind of look like drywall screws. And once all those screws are out I can pop the air box off and then remove the air filter. This engine cover here connects to this part over here and it's basically the entire resonator. So now the air intake has been removed it definitely clears up a lot of space under the hood here. Now that air intake is going to draw air down this tube over here to the turbocharger which is bolted to the exhaust side of the engine at the back here. Now that turbocharger is going to use the exhaust gases to spool up and pressurize some of that air intake and then send it down to the front of the vehicle to the air intercooler. Now looking through the front grille here you could see the air intercooler. Now that boosted air from the intercooler is then going to be sent up here to this drive-by wire throttle body and then into this plastic intake plenum before going down into the engine to get burned. Now taking a look at the top of the engine here you can see you've got a four ignition coils where the spark plugs would live so spark plug changes should be fairly straightforward on this engine. Taking a look at the engine itself you can see you've got an alloy valve cover at least it's not plastic and then under the timing cover we have a timing chain that powers dual overhead camshafts. Now the design of the camshafts on this engine is a little unique. First of all you got your regular variable valve timing which you can see the solenoids for over here. Then we've also got variable valve lift. It's got three different modes one for more power where you got a higher lift, one for your regular cruising around and one where there's no lift at all and it completely shuts off these middle two cylinders over here. Now on the intake side you've got four actuators and then on the exhaust side you've got two over here which are going to turn off these middle two cylinders when you're just cruising around and you don't need all that power. Now just in front of that timing chain setup you've got the drive belts over here. Here you can see the alternator which is pretty easy to access with just two bolts and it comes right out the top. Furthermore the AC compressor which is a little bit further down also comes out through the top here. It is pretty easy to access. You've got a lot of room at the side here compared to a lot of other vehicles. Now here you've got the belt tensioner but you also notice that there's no water pump on this drive belt. That's because it's an electric water pump. Now this engine takes 0W20 weight oil and it's got this nice little extension here to help you spill oil all over the engine. And in addition the dipstick is right here pretty easy to access. Now taking a look under the Chevy Blazer's engine, you can see we have a plastic oil pan which I hate very much because these can get brittle over time and warp and leak and then you end up with replacing it more often than a stamped steel one. Also if you hit something with it, it's probably easier to crack than a stamped steel one which would bend. You've also got this easy release style oil drain plug which you can see is not doing a very good job at sealing. And you've got this canister style oil filter which is easy to just twist off and screw on as opposed to the cartridge ones which make more mess. Now just beside that oil filter, filter there's this oil cooler here to either warm up the oil when it's cold or cool it down when you're overheating on the side of the road. Now like many four-cylinder vehicles there's two main engine mounts holding the assembly together. Here you can see we've got one engine mount on the transmission side over here and then on this side we've got your main engine mount on the passenger side. Now this is the first time I'm seeing this they're actually making engine mounts out of plastic now. And you can see this one here is just made out of plastic as well as the housing for this one here where it mounts to the transfer case. Taking a look at the exhaust up on the Chevy Blazer. The exhaust manifold is actually integrated into the head and this turbocharger here mounts directly to it. The turbocharger is going to use that exhaust gas to pressurize the air intake and give you more boost. The exhaust gases are then going to be routed out this way to the catalytic converter which goes down and then send the exhaust to the back of the vehicle. Now on top of that turbocharger here you can see the motor that's going to control the electronic wastegate on this turbo. Now that catalytic converter is going to send that exhaust down to this flex pipe over here and then over to this mid muffler and then out to the back. Now that that exhaust is going to be sent up to this rear muffler here where it's going to exit through these two separate tailpipes. And now we'll have a listen to the exhaust. Mm -hmm. 
Taking a look under the bumper here, you can see you've got this tubular structure that's bolted to the frame here. That's actually part of the trailer hitch, which would mount up to this square here once you take off this part of the bumper cover. Now this tubular structure here is what forms the rear bumper bar, or the rear crash bar. You can see all up here, it's all hollow up to the rear body panel. There's no foam behind here either, so I'm pretty sure one little tap on this bumper is probably going to crack. I think GM should have did a better job with a proper crash bar at the back here, or at least put a foam behind this hitch thing. So when you remove this cover here you can see the hitch and the wiring harness we put this here because this is a Chevy Blazer and you probably need to tow your father-in-law's ship or put a bike rack on it or something now taking a look at that nine-speed automatic transmission there isn't really much that we can see from up above here here you can see the shifter rod which is going to shift your park reverse neutral and drive now taking a look at that nine-speed transmission from underneath you can see you got the valve body with the plastic cover over here that sits upright towards the front of the vehicle now just in front of that valve body and transmission pan we have an external transmission cooler to hopefully prolong the life of your nine-speed automatic transmission at least up until the warranty is done underneath here there's no real transmission pan but we do have the drain port over here to change the fluid taking a look at the transmission through the wheel well here we've got the axle and you look up here is the fill port for the transmission fluid and this would be your fill check plug where you pull it out where excess transmission fluid would drain once the vehicles reached operating temperature now looking just behind the radiator fan you can see there's actually another starter bolted up to the transmission now this engine does have start stop technology so I wonder how long these starters are gonna last now while that transmission mainly powers the front wheels, we do have a transfer case for the all-wheel drive setup. Now this transfer case is going to take some power from that front differential over here and distribute it back to this prop shaft where it's going to go to the rear differential. Now transfer cases also have fluid in them that need to be serviced. Here you can see the fill port as well as the drain port. Now that prop shaft is going to connect over to this big giant housing over here which is going to lead up to the rear differential. Now that rear differential is going to need servicing. You do have a drain port and a fill port over here. It's going to send power from the front prompt shaft out to the rear wheel. So these little itty bitty axles here which would give you just enough torque to get out of the grass when you go camping. Over on the passenger side here you can see the motor disconnect for that prop shaft so that it only engages when you need it. Taking a look at some of the electronics like any modern vehicle there's going to be wires and hoses everywhere. The ECU is located right up at the front here. That's to make the wiring harness nice and short but I don't like that because it's right behind the radiator here it makes it kind of hard to get to things and it's also susceptible to collision damage up at the front here here you've got the battery located nice and easy right up at the top here and they even give you these little ports here making it easy for you to jump the vehicle especially if you run out of juice from blasting music in the parking lot while you're waiting for your mother-in-law to come out of the Sears outlet store furthermore we've got the windshield washer reservoir and the fuse box located right here which is nice and labeled now taking a look under the Chevrolet Blazer, you can see this is where GM's done a little bit of cost cutting. You can see nothing here is covered up. There's no plastic or aerodynamic panels. There's no mud guards. Everything's just open to the elements, which can cause it to rust. Now one thing I do like is that you've got a fully boxed in subframe going all the way around, including up to the front here. A lot of newer vehicles are not even including this front piece here and making it out of plastic. Lends to a little bit more structural rigidity, and it gives you this jack point at the center here so you can jack up your vehicle on the side of the road on the way back from the casino when you're wondering what you hit. Taking a look at the suspension on the Chevy Blazer here you can see they've cheaped out again by just using a stamped steel lower control arm as opposed to maybe an aluminum one. However it is pretty easy to change out if you have to do it. You've got two bolts over here and then two more bolts at the back bushing over there as well as an integrated ball joint up at the knuckle here. At least the knuckle is made of aluminum alloy but I don't like how the ball joint is pointing up because you probably don't have enough room to get your fastener on here and you have to remove the axle in order to get the ball joint out anyways. Now luckily the bearings on this vehicle are a bolt-on style bearing where you got three main fasteners over here and you don't need a press to change it out it just bolts off so here's one thing I don't like about a lot of domestic brands is that the fasteners are no longer reusable so for example if you got to take this tie right off in order to do another job like change a bearing or some other suspension component well you got to find a new nut for that fastener now because it often has nylock on it thread lock or it's some one-time use yield to torque type of fastener Taking a look at the front suspension on the Chevy Blazer, you can see we've got a McPherson strut front design here, which you can see is not very optimal for handling or for off-road capability, but it is going to be suited for a regular crossover duty, and it is cheaper to service over time. It's just bolted on with two bolts over here, and then a couple more bolts at the top there, and you could change it out when it does wear out. Now here you've got the inner and outer tie rod, and then the sway bar end link, which bolts up to the strut here. This middle part here is made of metal, however the ball socket part is made of plastic. And here's another a look at that lower control arm over here taking a look at the rear suspension on the Chevy Blazer the first thing I notice is that this rear shock here is actually leaking oil this is a brand new vehicle and you got oil all over the shock 
kind of sad and tells you a little bit about GM's quality control. Also, did they put the left side spring on the right side of the vehicle? Why does this say L on it? Now, continuing along, you can see the Chevy Blazer uses a multi-link suspension set up at the back here, but they are still cost-cutting by using stamped steel components instead of aluminum. You can see that the rear subframe here is made of stamped steel as well as this lower control arm. And from underneath here, you can see all the remaining suspension components here are made of stamped steel, including these arms at the top here and at the front here. Now just like the front, the rear does use aluminum knuckles with a bolt-on bearing. So you just have to take off these three bolts here and the bearing should pop out. You don't need a press to change it out. Likewise, changing shocks shouldn't be too difficult, especially given that this one's already leaking. You're probably going to be doing that frequently. There's a couple of bolts up under the wheel liner over there as well as a bolt down at the bottom of the control arm over here. Now the sway bar end link is this little tiny guy right here which leads to this sway bar. It's a decent size but I'm sure it's pretty hollow. And that's going to mount up to the subframe over here. I suspect you can probably upgrade this sway bar to a larger diameter one to give you better handling on the racetrack. Now taking a look at the rear suspension from outside here, there will be two bolts underneath this cover here that you need to remove in order to remove the shock. I do like however that it's a separate unit and not integrated with the spring itself so it's going to be much easier to service. From the top here we've got another look at the upper control arms. You've got one control arm trailing along this way and the upper control arm which has a unique I-beam style design to it. They're all made of stamped steel however. And from the front side here you can see the other two lower control arms that are kind of crisscrossing each other as they join to the knuckle. Some of these arms use just regular bushings such as this one here whereas the top one here uses a spherical bushing. Here we've also got the sway bar link which actually attach using a bushing instead of a ball joint over here to the knuckle directly as opposed to being attached to one of the control arms. Even the lower control arm down here uses a spherical bushing so that's interesting. And overall this five link design is not new. Many SUVs now are using this design. It's pretty compact as opposed to a McPherson strut design but it also lends for good handling compared to just like a twist beam design like in more economy cars. I just wish that GM would use a little bit more aluminum to optimize the suspension a little bit more because you are paying quite a penny for this vehicle. Looking down through the passenger side here at the headlight assembly you can see it's just a giant black box here that's mounted to the body as well as to the bumper. That's one thing I don't like about this design is that the headlight is right in the line of where you would normally collide with things or maybe a dented Toyota Camry comes up to you in the parking lot and cracks that headlight housing. Seems like it could have been placed a little bit higher up where it's less susceptible to damage. So it seems like these headlights have a computer module attached to them over there which is going to make it expensive if you have to replace it. Now here's another thing I don't like what GM's done and I saw Ford has also been doing this. This fender area here is completely hollowed out. I feel like any little punch here you could probably dent it in and this area is actually very sharp. You can cut your hand here and this is just a hollow area. I feel like they did this just to pass a small overlap test where all this would just get skimmed off leaving the rest of it intact. Taking a look at the cooling system on the Chevy Blazer. This here is the radiator cap which is essentially the pressure cap for the entire system. I just wish they paid more attention to holding these hoses down and not just leaving them so loose and slack. It's kind of cost cutting to me. So you can see some of that coolant is going to come down towards the front of the vehicle here. The main hose is this upper radiator hose here which is going to go down underneath the air intake. Under there there's a coolant control valve which is going to decide where the coolant needs to go into the engine or if it's too cold to keep the coolant from circulating around the engine. Now down below that charge pipe is a lower radiator hose which goes underneath the engine to the back. Now over here on the front right corner of the vehicle you can see the electric water pump. That's right this vehicle does not have a mechanical water pump it just uses an electric motor to circulate the coolant. Here you can see the low radiator hose where it plugs into this plastic housing which I don't like because it can crack. Then you've got the low radiator hose that's going to run back up to the thermostat behind the turbocharger. So speaking of cooling here you can see the giant plastic fan situated behind the radiator and then just beside that fan you can see we've got these passive flaps here that are just going to open up with airflow as the vehicle is moving at higher speed. And looking through the front grill here where the AC condenser is you can see we've got active air shutters but man these flaps are super flimsy. I feel like a bird at Walmart parking lot could probably do a lot of damage flying through here. Now while the fan radiator and condenser lives under here. Surprisingly the manual does not require you to remove the front fascia in order to change them out. You can actually access them from the front here and slide them out this way. I like that because you don't have to do too much work in order to get them out. Now one thing I do like about the Blazer is that they're still giving you a metal radiator support that goes across the front here as opposed to a plastic one which can easily crack in a minor collision. Taking a look at the fuel system on the Blazer, the low pressure fuel pump from the tank is going to bring the fuel up to here. This here is the high pressure fuel pump which is powered off of the exhaust camshaft that's going to pressurize the gasoline and then send it down underneath the intake to four direct injectors which are going to directly inject gasoline into the combustion chamber. Now over time using direct injection only will cause carbon buildup 
and you're gonna have to remove this air intake to clean off those valves if you want good performance. Here you are underneath the vehicle, you can see you've got a plastic fuel tank that's divided by the prop shaft for the rear differential. You've also got the small heat shield over here and this is the EVAP canister. The one thing I don't like is this is the fuel line right here and I feel like anything could just come and hit that. It's just sitting so low and so open, especially when you try to hop the median and a local traffic jam. Also, what's up with this rail here with these perforated holes? It's actually on both sides over here. I wonder if that meant that they were supposed to put a skid plate across here, but they left it out. Now from behind the fuel tank here, you can see we've got this line here again that's also hanging pretty low. I feel like something could easily catch on to that and cause you to get a fuel leak or an evap leak. Taking a look at the brake setup on the Chevy Blazer, here you can see we've got the brake fluid reservoir and then further down here you can see we've got the brake actuator. It's actually an electric brake actuator. There's no more vacuum assisted brake boosters or master cylinders anymore. That also controls the ABS, traction control and automatic braking system on this vehicle. Now on the other side of that brake actuator is the computer located over here and that's responsible to control all those systems. The only downside is if you need to do any brake work you will need a scan tool to activate that. Taking a look at the front brakes here on the Chevy Blazer, we've We've got a dual piston floating caliper design which is great I like to see dual piston on vehicles this big so it should give you good braking performance the only thing I found is when I was driving it the brake pedal was super stiff and it was kind of hard to stop it I don't like that they're using these annoying rotor screws this one's actually a torque so it probably will strip out even faster now taking a look at the rear brakes on the Chevy Blazer it's a single piston floating caliper design on a disc rotor pretty easy to access and work on however at the back here we do have an electronic parking brake which is going to clamp these down together when you actuate it I'm sure there's a reset procedure for that when you do a brake job however. Now the Chevy Blazer uses electric power steering. Here you can see the entire assembly with the motor integrated into the steering rack. Here's a look at that electric steering motor from underneath as well as the pinion as it goes into the rack from down below. So I'm trying to put this air box back together and I noticed that GM's literally just drilled a hole right through two pieces of plastic and put these self-tapping screws in there. So I can see after a couple of air filter changes this is going to become super loose and probably will need to be replaced and it won't seal properly. All right, let's have a listen to the engine. Now, in my opinion, driving this thing around, I feel like the engine is very unrefined and noisy. In my opinion, you should probably opt for the V6 if that's a concern. So overall, I think the Chevy Blazer is just an average vehicle. There's nothing too difficult about it to work on. It's not stupid simple either. After all, it is a turbocharged engine, and we do have to question GM's reliability when it comes to mechanical things. Overall, I think the Blazer was just a placeholder vehicle until they could get themselves together to make the Blazer EV, which is coming out next year. And I think that's one of the reasons why there's a lot of cost cutting under the hood and underneath this vehicle and some questionable things because they just slapped it together on the Equinox platform just to get it out the door. Now you tell me in the comment section down below what do you think of the Chevy Blazer? Do you think that GM's onto something with the Camaro styling or it's just going to be another one of those GM's that are going to be cluttering our junkyards in 10 years or so? Make sure you subscribe if you want to see more videos just like this one.